How aerodynamic was the Jaguar E-Type? To find out, we did a simulation of it in the convertible version with the windows completely down and then with the windows completely up. Now, a lot of people think that this is one of the most beautiful cars in history. And if you think it is, then you're wrong. So let's focus on it with the windows down. The aerodynamics of this car are a little strange because there are some really good bits, but some really terrible bits too. For example, at the front, the flow is pretty well behaved. Because the car is so pointed here, it really divides the flow nicely into two halves. And impressively, the air doesn't accelerate much as it travels over this region, which is very rare. Usually the flow really accelerates over the nose of the car. For example, the Audi R8. Then as the flow travels over the hood, it is incredibly well behaved. That is because the hood is almost completely flat, so the flow is quite straight too. But while that may seem really good here, this strength actually becomes a massive weakness of the Jag. You can see that as the flow meets the windshield, everything goes haywire. To begin with, the flow crashes into the windshield and we can see that it becomes greener and bluer, which means it is decelerating. We'll see later how that affects the pressure. It is then aggressively redirected upwards, which sets the rest of the Jag up for problems because once the flow reaches the top of the windshield, it's traveling so sharply upwards that it just blows out and creates a massive wake over the cabin. Now there was always going to be a wake over the cabin, but if Jaguar sloped the windshield more, the wake wouldn't have been so severe. As it stands, a huge amount of drag is created because of this recirculation zone. And things get even worse because you can see that the flow doesn't even reattach, so the rest of the car is just now in separated flow. So in a way, the extremely large wake from the front windshield is actually good in the sense that you can pretty much do anything you want on the rear of the car, and it wouldn't affect the aerodynamics. Like you could even put a turret at the back and you'll still have similar aero. One thing Jag could have done to reduce the wake over the back of the car is to raise the back up so you effectively still have the rear window but you've just cut off the roof and that's it. That way the air has something to reattach to and the wake would be smaller and the drag would be much lower. As a bonus, the people wouldn't be blown around as much or maybe not the driver depending on what the passenger is doing but the passenger would be blown around less because of the shielding. As it stands, the really flat back surface is just too out of alignment with the flow and too low down for the air to reattach. So the car's wake becomes huge. Looking at the underbody, there was a lot of potential here, but there were some key mistakes that led to pretty unaerodynamic performance. I mean, okay, this was done back in the 60s, but for example, the front nose is just too detailed. There are too many small surfaces, so the flow just goes over the bumper, then has to go over another surface and then another. All of that takes more and more energy out of the flow. As such, once it finally reaches the underbody, it doesn't have enough energy to stay attached over the curve. We then get some separation here. Traveling down the underbody, the flow starts to become pretty good because we can see how straight and well behaved it is. But then after the front wheels, it meets the exhaust. And this is really one major area that could be easily improved upon. By jag sticking the exhaust into the flow, it just makes the air separate and ruins the underbody aerodynamics. The exhaust travels almost the entire length of the underbody. And so the air has little chance to produce really good downforce. And because the flow is so chaotic, once it reaches the diffuser, it separates and produces even more drag and even less downforce. You can see that the wake here is very much downwards, which tells us that lift is being produced. Let's now look at the pressure to see how it was affected. Immediately, we see a lot of high pressure over 200 pascals at the front. This has to do a lot with a large bumper. Over the top of the roof, we get very low pressure, which tells us that lift is being produced here. That low pressure could be mitigated by rounding the nose less and making it more pointed. Then, because all of that air was crashing into the front windshield, the pressure skyrockets, and because the windshield is so upright, much of that high pressure creates a lot of drag, especially considering that the inside face of the windshield is very low pressure. So the pressure drag is huge here. In the cabin, we see very low pressure, which means that air will be sucked into it more, and that creates more blowing for the people inside. I guess as a bonus, the low pressure here helps suck the people down into their seats, so there is little chance of them flying out but this low pressure also creates even more lift for the car itself. Then the flow over the rear is very low pressure, which again increases the lift. So overall, the top surface is producing lift everywhere except the windshield. As for the underbody, the highly stylized front is actually pretty good in the sense that it produces very low pressure locally, and hence downforce here. But that comes at the expense of drag, and you could probably get even more downforce without the drag penalty by simplifying the front and just rounding it a little more. The rest of the underbody is producing okay low pressure, but overall, the average pressure here isn't as low as it is over the top of the Jag. How does the windshield affect the cabin though? To find out, we have this top view, and it's pretty cool because the cabin is kind of acting in its own cocoon of slow moving air. In fact, velocities down to almost 0 meters per second are found right in the middle. But there is obviously a lot of swirling, which is what makes non-bold people have their hair swirling around too. 
It's pretty cool how between the edge of the windshield and the side mirror, the flow just shoots through at almost 30% faster than the free stream flow. One major saving grace of the windshield is that it is quite rounded, which helps guide the flow a little more around, and from this pressure plot, that actually reduces the pressure a little. If it was flatter, then the pressure would be even higher, particularly as you move to the edges, which would then manifest itself as even higher pressure drag. The low pressure in the cabin is all-encompassing, like, if you tried to jump out of this car at high speed, you would probably feel a little bit of suction pulling you back. Looking at these vortices, the good news is that because much of the car is in a wake, very few vortices are created over the top of it, but the cabin is obviously producing massive vortices. The front wheels suffer from large jetting vortices lower down, but also larger vortices from the top of the wheels and wheelhouses, which are pretty rare on modern cars. This is largely because modern cars shield their wheels much better. These wheels are very exposed. Likewise, the rear wheels produce very large vortices too. The rear has some vortices, but is actually one of the more well-behaved regions. These streamlines show us just how disjointed the flow is over the jack. It is really nice over the front, but then it hits the front windshield, zips over the cabin, and just goes haywire from there. One thing to note is you can see at the edge of the windshield, the flow seeps down over the side of the car before jumping back up over the boot. On regular cars, that wouldn't be great because it would lead to a greater wake, but here, it helps reduce the wake because the entire boot is starved of flow anyway. So any flow going over it helps reduce its wake. Looking at the drag, the cabin is definitely the major contributor to the drag and overshadowing really everything else combined. The rear is actually very respectable with even less drag than the wheels. Oh wait, no way. Its drag coefficient is 0.45, which is equal to a 60s beetle. What about its lift? It comes in at 13.8 kilos at 72 kph, which is very high, but expected. Now that was for the windows down. What happens when you put the windows up? Let's find out. From this side view, there isn't too much of a difference. There is still a massive wake over the cabin, but perhaps there is a little less wake over the rear, just marginally. The rear diffuser is still pretty terrible too. The pressure looks pretty similar here too, with very low pressure in the cabin, and then a little higher pressure over the boot. Looking from above, Perhaps one difference is that the wake in the cabin becomes squarer with less flow from around the windshield rushing inwards, but there are still a bunch of recirculation regions inside which still blow around the people. And perhaps a little surprisingly, the streamlines still follow a very similar path, they pop up over the cabin pretty equally. Maybe you could argue that the cabin drag was slightly lower here? So when driving in the convertible version, having the windshields up or down doesn't really change the aerodynamics too much and that is reflected in the fact that the drag coefficient was almost the same, coming in at 0.44, and the lift being 12.8 kilos, so a little lower, but not that much. Peace out amigos.